حسبن الله نعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين There's a place in a hadith and ziyarat that we have where the imams have uh, uh, taught us to make this dua to Allah this dua to Allah uh, in which it says Allahumma j'al mahyaya mahya muhammadin wa ali muhammad wa mamati mamata muhammadin wa ali muhammad Allah make my life the life of Muhammad and his children and make my death the death of Muhammad and my children that my life that I'm living this life that I am uh, trying to uh, go by this life I want it to be like the life that the Prophet had like Ahlul Bayt had this is a dua that Allah is asking us to make now when it comes to duas you always have to understand two things right there are two ways of making duas there are two ways of making duas that we have been taught and told one way of making dua as you see is that we uh, uh, take the name of Allah and we speak their names a lot of times you see you know for example uh, dua joshan what is dua joshan are we asking for something in dua joshan Look at the whole of Dua Joshan. We're not asking for anything in Dua Joshan. Right? As'aluka ya hannano ya mannano ya kannan. You're just taking the names of Allah. I ask you for you know, these names, this and that. Right? Uh, when we are looking at that, and when we are seeing that, there are many times there are Duas that we just take the names of Allah. And then there are other Duas where we're actually asking for things. Where we are actually asking for things. So now... What happens is that when you're asking for something, right, it's also dua. When you're taking the name of Allah, it's also dua. The difference between the two, and both of them are duas. And both of them are correct ways of making duas. One, taking the name of Allah is also dua. And asking for something from Him is also dua. When you, when you see a dua where Allah's name is mentioned, there the dua is indirect where you see that you're asking for something, there the dua is direct. So in other words, what, what is being trained here, when you say, Ar-Rahman, Ya Rahman, it means that you ponder over the quality that Ya Rahman, right? You want us to be like this. So you ponder over that quality and you see that you're asking Allah, that Allah, I called you Rahman because I want that quality to affect me. I want that rahmat to affect me. This is why you do that. And what, those duas that you're asking for something, you are showing your needs to Allah that this is what I want, this is what I need. So when you make duas where you're taking the names of Allah, this is to raise your ma'rifat. This is to raise your ma'rifat of Allah and His being. And when you ask duas of asking for something, then this is to raise the awareness of your need towards Allah. To show that we are in need of Allah. This is what it does. Here when we are asking, Allahumma j'al mahyaya, Allah make my life the life of Muhammad. So now what Allah is saying when we are making this dua, so now in return, what we need to do, what is in this and hidden inside this as a message, is that we need to strive to make our life the life of Muhammad and his family. That's what we need to do. We need to strive to do that. What is our general view of life? What is our view of life? What do you think about life? What is life to you? You know, I mean, we are all alive. We know that. But do we have a view of what life is? Do we have an outlook of what is life? What is our life? You know, what is this that we call life? My friends, I'm raising these subjects because in the next few days I want to speak about this. A person 
who doesn't have a general outlook on life will always get drowned in the specific details of life. If someone doesn't have the big picture of what life is, he will be completely engrossed in the small details of life. Most people get depressed because of this reason. They don't understand what life is and they get involved in the small details of life. This thing happened to me, that thing happened to me. These are like small details of life that if we don't have the bigger picture in our mind and our view, you will be involved in that. You will just get engrossed in that. There's no way you can get out of it. It doesn't happen. You can't get out of it. You're just drowned in it. If someone doesn't know how to look at his complete life, such a person, when he becomes happy in life, he will drown in his happiness. When he becomes sad in life, he will drown in his sadness. He doesn't know how to be happy. He doesn't know how to be sad. Every emotion will kill him. Every emotion will lead to his destruction. Every emotion that he has. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So when we, the first idea right now I want to establish for us, and we'll go step by step in reasoning. The first idea I want you to establish is if a person, if a human being doesn't have a general idea of what life is, he will drown in the specifics of life, in the small particulars of life. You will see those things will become so big for him that he wouldn't know how to handle them because he doesn't understand what life is. And this is more... There's many of our problems. For us, you know, a lot of times, it, if we understand what life is, then our the specifics of life and the details of life would make perfect sense and we would know how to deal with them in the correct way. Not just tolerate them, but actually being happy with them. But what happens? If we understand what life is, and this is what I want to go through with what Allah and Ahlul Bayt have said to us. My friends, if you can use this time to learn what uh, the teachings uh, our Ahlul Bayt have given us, I think this is uh, the best use of these nights and these times that we have together in this uh, opportune month of Ramadan. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A lot of times, when people do not know the meaning of life, that's why, that's when they will, um, uh, you see that they will uh, make the smaller things in life bigger in their eyes. And even in our du'as, for example, when we don't understand life, then our du'as are for things that are small and specific, right? You know, because the reason is specific is because we don't understand the general outlook of life that Allah has given us. That naturally we have. Because we don't understand it, now you see the du'as of people and you can judge people by the du'as how much they know of their life. If you see this person saying that, you know, uh, I owe this guy $101.50, Allah, you know, if you can give me that $101.50, that, you know, will be there. So they go all the way down to the cents to make sure that they're specific, you know. And... The overall idea, because the reason they are into the specific, the reason this has become so important that they need to ask someone like Allah for this, that's very important to understand, you know. I mean, if you have a chance to uh, speak with, uh, let's say, someone who's very important, someone who's very influential, someone who's very rich, and you have this one chance to talk to him, right, uh, if you go to him, and you have this one chance to talk. And he says, you know, I will give you whatever you want. Whatever you want. You know, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. So now, if he says that to you, and you have a chance to go to him, and you have an audience with him, what would you ask? I mean, it, would qu it will be quite insulting to ask him, hey, listen, you know, my light bill is not paid if you can pay that. <laughs> you know, he'll be like... Listen, I can give you so much and you're asking for a light bill? That's it? That's all you ask for? 
you know, this one person, you know, he came to Rasulullah. He was a uh, Bedouin. He came to Rasulullah and said, I heard that you give everything, you know, like anything you ask for, this and that. Is that true? The Rasulullah said, yes, I will give you whatever you ask for me right now. And all the Ashab and the companions were like, man, this is, you know, something special that Rasulullah is giving him a chance to ask for salvation, for eternal happiness, you know, for ultimate pleasure. He can ask for anything right now. And this guy who was there, who had this opportunity, he said, all right, you can give me anything you want. Yes. All right, I want 40 sheep. That will make my life. <laughs> what? That's it? 40 sheep? <laughs> so Allah said, all right, you know, give him 40 sheep. You know, he got his 40 sheep. But the fact is that he could have asked for a lot more. A lot of times we ask for little things because that's the marifat we have of life. That's how much we know of it. That's why we are into that. We don't even know what to ask when we meet Allah. When we talk to Allah. Sometimes, you know, we are like this. Okay, Allah, I don't know what to ask, you know. But inshallah, just give me whatever. You know, whatever he is. I mean, he can give you whatever. He can give you anything you ask for. So you aim for something high. You aim for something that is befitting Allah to ask for. But many times because we give importance to smaller issues in life, that's why we get bogged down with those issues and we never pay attention to the bigger picture of life. Because we haven't understood it. That's what I want to explain. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, it's strange that whenever a person starts thinking about life, Anyone. He doesn't have to be a Muslim. I'm talking about any human being. Whenever he starts thinking and reflecting about life, that's when he starts becoming a philosopher. Right? Everyone starts becoming a philosopher. Right? Where does life come from? Because it, it, it's real for him. Right? It's something personal. If a person can reach that, a lot of times people don't even think about their life. It just goes by. Their life goes by and they don't even think about it. Sometimes they do think about it and that's when they start becoming a philosopher and start asking questions. Start asking why. Why is this happening to me? Where I come from? These type of questions. And life, my friends, is so important. If you look at the teachings of Islam, you see that before uh, the lessons of Tawheed and Nabuwat are taught, before all of that, Ahlul Bayt taught us the principles of life first. You know, when we, unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, we, uh, we don't know how to teach. We don't know how to learn. We have learned wrong. And so we are teaching Islam wrong. You go to these places, they say, they emphasize on Aqaid right at the beginning. Tawheed. Nabuwat. They started off right here without understanding that the way Ahlul Bayt have taught us, no, they spoke about life first and the principles of life before they spoke about Aqaid. One of the interesting uh, uh, letters of Imam Ali is to his uh, children. Uh, it's letter number 31, Najul Balagha. And it's interesting and it's also uh, the most relevant for everyone. You see, every khutbah that Imam Ali gave, every... Um, letter that he wrote, you see, is specific for certain people. You know, for example, the letter to Maliki Ashtar is specific to uh, people who want to rule others, administrators, managers, those type of people, right? It's not for everyone. Right? Yeah, you can learn things, you know, this and that, but it's meant for those people, instructions for them, right? For example, uh, Khutbah Hammam. It's meant for muttaqeen. <laughs> Most of us are not muttaqeen. So, <laughs> yeah, the idea is that it's meant for muttaqeen people, those who have attributes, this and that, and you're like, wow, it's for that. Right? But this letter that Imam Ali wrote to his children, this letter is an all-comprehensive letter that whose audience is everyone. Everyone. And you don't have to be an alim. You don't have to be muttaqi. You don't have to be pious. You don't have to be anything. Just a human being. Imam Ali wrote this letter to his children. Now in that letter, you see Imam Ali did not start off with Allah and Nabuwat and Qiyamah, this and that. What Imam Ali started off with was life. 
teaching his children about life. He says, this is life. This is life. This is life. Teaching them the principles of life so that when they learn the principles of life, then Tawheed would make sense to them. My friends, those who don't understand the principle of life, you can explain Tawheed to them. They will never understand. It won't go down their mind. It won't go into their skulls. It won't happen. Right? You start speaking about Nabuat, it doesn't make sense to them because they haven't understood life yet. It's people who understand life who are looking for the knowledge of Tawheed. And you don't have to go after them. They'll come after you if you have the knowledge. They'll come after you. You don't need to go after them. You call them with different titles like seekers of truth. These people are who? They have people who have understood life. And they now want to fulfill that meaning of life. That's why they come here. For example, they'll come here to accept Islam. Well, let me teach you about what do you want to become Muslim for? Look at us. You know, we are fighting all the time. What do you want to become Muslim for? He said, I'm not becoming for you. I'm not becoming Muslim for you. I'm becoming Muslim because that is what I have recognized as the truth in my life. Because they thought about life. You see, life is what makes them, understanding life is what makes them do these things. And the same thing applies to us also, my friends. The fact is that we have, uh, we know Tawheed, we know Nabuwat, we know Imamat and Qiyamat, but these things really don't make sense to many of us. It's not real for us. It's not real in our life. It's not real in our life. That's why, for example, we have to be told what we need to do because there's no relationship we have. See, if, again, you know, if I liked a girl and if I wanted her, right, and if someone has else has to tell me, hey, listen, this is what you need to tell her, this is what you need to tell her, then you know what? I really don't have a relationship with her. If I have a relationship with her, I don't need to listen to you. I know what I have to do. I know what I have to say. If you have a relationship with Ahlul Bayt, then we don't need to be told how we should behave with them. We know how to be. There's a relationship I have. I know them. Right? They're personal to me. This is the reason, my friend, understand how important it is to know the uh, reality of life before we know the reality of Tawheed and Nabuwat and any of these things. Because that's how Ahlul Bayt have taught us. That's how Imam Ali has taught his children in this letter. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Life is happening right now and it's going on. It's what we make use of it, what we think of it, and what outlook we have on it. Right is life. Without knowing what life is, then no teachings of Islam make sense to us because we don't know where to apply them. I can teach you to be strong and brave, but you will say, okay, brave. Where does bravery go in? How does it work? Right? Yeah, I can speak to you about taqwa and piety. You say, all right, great, piety. Let's see, how do I... Where in life is piety? Where in my life is piety? I mean, really? Because if you don't know life, you wouldn't know where to place these things. That's why it's important to understand life before we place the teachings of Islam in them and know what they are for. And that's what you know we want to, inshallah, discuss in these days that we are here. But as a beginning, as a beginner uh, thought, right? I'll just put some thoughts out there for today. And inshallah, we'll go into details from tomorrow and speak about it. If we want to define life, how should we define it? What should be the definition of life? All right, before I define it, let's see, you know, for example, uh, ideas that I have. And you can agree with it or not agree with it. And this, this part of the uh, speech is, you know, my ideas. Right, so as as a uh, disclaimer, I'm saying this. Don't think this is from Ahlul Bayt or teachings and this and that, but just ideas that you can think rationally and sensibly, and logically. You know, to say that okay makes sense. You know, how should be the definition of life? What? How you should? How can you define this life? Right? How can you define this life? 
I think that, you know, uh, whatever definition of life that we are going to make up or we are going to think about, what it should be is a definition that makes us love life. A definition that makes us love life. That life should be uh, more attractive for us when we define it. Right? It, it should be attractive for us. I, I mean, you're, now if you define life in a way that's distracted, and I, you know what, I don't like it. Now obviously, you know what, I don't like to live it. No, I will be upset that I have this life that I don't like. And the definition of it, and that is defined in reality, not in words, but in reality is defined in a way that I don't like it. I don't like this life. So if you don't like it, then it, we would be feeling depressed to live it. Right? We would really be feeling depressed to live this life. So we should like that life. So life should be defined in that way. At least that's what I think. Number two, life should we define in a way that we should love it so much that we appreciate the one who gave it to us. Right? That we should uh, also fall in love with the person who gave it to us. Meaning, you know what? Let me tell you one thing. You know, for example, uh, you can try this on your children if you have it and see it for yourself. Right? Now, you know what your children want for your birthday, right? For their birthday, right? You know what they want. Now, when they want something for their birthday, let's say, you know, they want an Xbox, right? They want an Xbox for their birthday, and um, you end up giving him Mr. Bean's doll, right? Now, when he opens the package, <laughs> now what will he say? What will be his reaction? Right? Yeah, will he be like, hey, thanks, Dad, I love you? Or is he like, uh, what's this? It's a gift. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right? You see that thank you is not real? The thank you is not bringing that, the gift is not bringing the love for the one who gave it? Now, if you had given him a gift that he loves, then not only will he love that gift, but he'll also love you for giving it to him. He'll say, thanks, Dad, I love you. You know, and he'll grab you and this and then he'll be like, ha, ha, ha. Right? You feel good also. Right? You want him to say that, right? You want to see this reaction from him. I mean, that's the price of giving the gift. Right? You want to see this reaction, this reaction of love from him. The fact is that when Allah gave us this gift of life, right? life should be such that we should be thankful to him and fall in love with him because he gave it to us. So life should be defined that way also. Then not only are we attracted towards it, but we fall in love with the one who gave this gift to us. It has to be defined. Otherwise, if you don't define it that way, then you know what? It will say, uh, yeah, Allah, thank you. You, know? <laughs> you could have done better. but <laughs> you know? This could happen, right? I, this is why you know, understanding life in the correct way is very important. What is the definition of life? What is it defined as? And that's what we want to do in these few days. Define it in a really good way. Right? A real way that Islam has taught us. The way that, you know, Allah wanted us to see life. That's what we need to do it right. The question that a lot of people ask, why did Allah make me? Right? When they ask this question, why did Allah make me? You know, it's actually uh, asking Allah that what is this life? That you gave me. Because me without my life. Doesn't make sense. Right. Me without my life. Can you separate yourself from your life? Okay. I am different. My life is different. No. You are in a vessel of life. That's going. Can't get out of it. You're living. You're alive. Right. And that life must be understood. To know me. A lot of times people ask this question. Why did Allah create me? Why did Allah make me? The only reason they ask these questions is because they are in problems. The only reason a person asks this question is because they are in trouble. They are uh, suffering. That's why they ask this question. If the same person was in paradise, in Jannah, he wouldn't be asking this question. 
You know, if your son is having fun, right, he wouldn't be asking questions. So, why did you give me birth? You know, he's too happy, you know, being a kid. It's only when you grow up and get into troubles of life and the specifics of life and get drowned in them, that's when this question comes up. Why was I made? Why did Allah made me for? This life is miserable. They don't understand life because they are drowned in the small little things of life. And what we want to do is understand life so that we don't get drowned in the specifics and particulars of life. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Many people see things in a different way. Those who see life, they see events in a different way. They see events in a different way, you know. People, when they go outside and they have certain events, they see certain things, certain scenes, you know. So obviously, you know, they have certain ideas regarding them, right? But you see those people who understood life, they see events differently. They have a different view of events, you know. You know, it's like you take the blue pill in Matrix, you know, and your eyes open up and you're like now looking at different ways of looking at things, you know. Wow, I used to eat here. You know, it's like different. Life becomes different when you understand what life is. Those who are not understanding life, they go into the specifics of life and particulars of life and that's it. They end up drowning themselves. But when you see life, then you see differently. What would you say if your loved ones were killed for no reason, for the wrongest of reasons? Right? What would you say that you saw that scene of their killing and you saw the bloodshed and you saw the horrid way in, their, in which their lives were taken? These are people you love, your own brother, sister, children. Right? You see them. Dead. Now when you come out of that scene, that murder scene, the crime scene, what would you say to others if they ask you? If an interviewer comes to you and says, so, how do you feel? Right? If, if the people who died in the shooting here were your relatives and you were there. Now, if an interviewer asks you, so, how do you feel about it? So what would you say? Right? I mean, would you say that, you know, obviously the answers would be the cliche answers that everyone thinks of, you know, a lot of times people aren't even honest with their answers. You know, they come out with answers like that. But also depends on your own view of life, outlook of life. What would be, what would be your answer? What would be your answer in this case? Right? Would you say that it was sad, it was horrible, uh, it was disgusting? What do you think when you saw them, you know? Now, who would say that after seeing that scene of murder, that, man, this was beautiful. That was a thing of beauty. Oh, man, that was great. That was beautiful. You see that? How they died? That was beautiful. I mean, call them sick, right? Like, what is that? See, it's a different view, right? You know, when Zainab saw her family die and he was, she was asked, what do you feel? He, you know what she said? Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. What I saw was a thing of beauty. It was beautiful. See, the whole view of life changes. The whole outlook of life changes. When, when you see something like that. Zainab, when she saw her brother slain and when she saw her children being killed, for no reason. For her, this was a sight of beauty. Jamila. Ma ra'aytu illa Jamila. This was Jamil. This was beautiful what they did. We might not look at it that way, but this is the way those who understand life look at things. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq and the blessing to be on the right path, the wisdom to understand his guidance. Based on the reappearance of our Imam, make us his helper when he comes. Wahir Davan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Salawat Alam, Muhammad wa Alam, Muhammad.
So, brothers and sisters, we have kept this extra time for question and answers. Right? And so, if uh, people have any questions, if the sisters have any questions to ask, they can also uh, somehow ask. I don't know. Oh, there's a op door open there. You can open the door. All right? So, from now onwards, inshallah, we'll be having this small session after the speech for question and answers. So if you have anything to ask regarding the speech or maybe anything else also, we can raise other subjects. If you want to write them down also, then we can discuss them over the days that I'm here. Certain things that you want to speak about that are not a part of the speech. Right? We can do that also. Qadr. And you were talking about the job and uh, It made it sound like, you know, the, and the Layla to God, everything is just job and it's going to be destiny and that's it. Could you elaborate about Okay, that? I think, you know, um, those who have been there for the three speeches would understand what I'm saying because I explained in the three speeches, but to recap what I said, is this right you know um the reason it's called laylatul qadr is because allah wants to show his power through his planning and his planning is based on our decisions for us our decisions right we make decisions in our life allah knowing the decisions what we are going to make right is going to plan that these are the decisions you're going to make throughout the year but what we get into, the scenes we'll get into, the events that will happen in our life, and uh, the incidents that are going to take place in our life, these are decided for us on Laylatul Qadr. Meaning, for example, we'll get into an accident. It's decided on Laylatul Qadr. Allah decides that. Now, what we do when we get into the accident, what will be our reaction is our own reaction. Why? It's our own reaction. Right, that we ourselves are reacting to. I mean, some people say Alhamdulillah, right, and some people say, you know, that, 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 you know, damn this car, you know, whatever, right. They start to curse their life and you know, see how meaningless their life is, right. So obviously, you know, it's react. It's, it's their own reaction. Allah's not making them react. Allah's putting them in a different situation. Those situations are decided. And when you are in that situation, you make that decision. But since Allah knows the decisions you're going to make already, He has written them down anyway. And by, for example, for example, you know, in the layer to have, it comes that you're going to have a certain uh, disaster or something. But by saying, uh, or you didn't tell us, uh, they said that that changes it. So we have some other choices. Right. That's good, right? Now let me explain to you how Allah helps. What you ask for Allah on the night of Qadr is protection. Tonight is Laylatul Qadr, right? Ask Allah for protection from your own ignorance and from your own nafs. Allah, I will make mistake, but Allah, but you are there to protect me. Protect me from that. You know how Allah protects you? You would be surprised. I mean, it happens in ways that we don't understand. For example, you know, a person is alone in his house and... You know, a thought of a sin comes to his mind. You know, and a thought of a sin comes to his mind. Now that thought slowly grows into temptation. Temptation becomes an idea. Idea becomes a want, a wish. That wish becomes stronger until it turns into action. Right? So in between this time, a person has time, right? Now in between this time, if he had asked Allah for protection on the night of Qadr, so now Allah affords him protection. So as you see that he's making the intention to go and sin and he wants to do something wrong, for one minute he sees this, uh, uh, this wall hanging that says, Ya Aba Abdullah al Hussein. He just sees that and a thought comes into his mind that, you know what? <sighs> What am I thinking about? What am I doing? Right? And right away he changes. Now that wall hanging was there for a particular reason. It was to protect you. Allah put it there through the hands of someone. Now where did he bring it from? Because your wife had gone to Ziyarat and she brought it. And she kept it there. 
reason it was kept there for you on that day to protect you from doing a sin. This is, this is my friends, the way Allah protects you. We don't know how it happened. That's why we on the night of Qadr, we ask for protection. Now, if you don't ask for protection, uh, we love it, so Allah will let it go. Okay, go. You're making the decision, right? You go, do it, and you will do it, right? You will be drowned in that sin because there's no protection from Allah. You don't ask for it. You don't want it from Allah. This is why on the night of Qadr, when we are asking for things from Allah, this is, these are the things to ask for. Allah, uh, my ignorance is what I need protection from. My nafs is what I need this protection from. So please protect me throughout the year. You know where I'm going to. Please be there for me. My, and make yourself stronger and ask it stronger. So Allah you know, can make those things for you and make it come alive. So these are the ways you see how Allah will help you you know, and how he has destined things for you. But night of Qadr is the last night. But throughout the year we should be doing this. But night of Qadr, if you don't do it now, really, you know, then Allah has every right to now let all the, you know, uh, the, you know, the road hazard signs of the road. You know, the, roads ha the road hazard signs are there, you know, uh, road closed or something like that. Now, if someone comes and removes that, <laughs> <laughs> and you are traveling there, what will happen? You get into a major problem, right? So that's what Allah does. All right, you know, you don't want a road hazard sign? I'll take this off for you. Go ahead. Now live your life. Now when you live your life like that, hey, now you're open for any type of tragedies to come, right? But what are, what is a tragedy? That's the other question you ask. That inshallah, inshallah, you know, I will explain to you in the speeches of life. When we go through life, I'll explain to you. But simply to understand, my friends, what we think are tragedies are really not tragedies. Really, they're not tragedies. And by knowing what life is, you'll understand it very clearly, you know, that this is no tragedy at all. You know, in fact, you know, it's a blessing in disguise that we don't know. A lot of these things that we think are tragedies are not. So when we are trying to give sadaka to warn away tragedies, by tragedies, do we mean trials? If you are giving sadaqa to uh, ward away trials, it cannot work. It cannot work if you are a mu'min. If you are not a mu'min, yes, it will work. If you are a mu'min, then trials is a part of your life. Allah said that clearly in the Quran. Right? Uh, and does man think that he's going to be left alone without trials? Of course not. You're going to be tried. Ibtila and bala is a part of a mu'min's life. When he gives sadaqa, all he is doing, right, is that when the trials get too much for him, so he gives sadaqa in order to find a relief. You know, for example, you're in a bout, in a ring, you know, boxing match. And, you know, you're waiting for the ring, you know, the hell to ring so you can stop, you know. You're being pummeled. <laughs> you want to stop this round somehow. So you ask for the bell to be rung. So that when the bell rings, you're like, okay, I got a minute to rest now. So that is what it does. Sadaqah, what it does for a moment, it gives him a reprieve. It gives him a relief from the fight that he's in. Right? But it doesn't make it go away. The fight is still there. You have to get back. Okay, it's good. You know, take a breather and you come back in. Allah gives you that relief. As a breather, you know, go ahead, come back in. Because the more you'll fight, the better you'll become. That's the way it's going to be. Yes, sir. Okay. My friends, every nation is defined by its past and its future. Every person is defined by his past and his future. When you see someone's resume, what is the resume saying? What is your past and what is your future? Right? What did you do in the past and what do you want to become in the future? Two things define a human being. Two things define nations also. Every nation, when it wants to define itself, should see what is my past and what is my future? That is how uh, strong or how weak a nation is. 
So, when it comes to Islam and the nation of Islam, meaning the nation of Muslims, Ummatul Islamiyah, the Ummat of Islam, the Muslims, its nation, this nation is defined by its past and its future. And in short, in particular, the Shias, the Ahlul Bayt, the religion, the followers of Ahlul Bayt are defined by these two things. Their past is in Karbala and their future is Imam Mahdi. This is how we define ourselves. You know, our past, you can see, is Ashura. This is our past. This is what we are about. This is our roots. It goes back to that. We are children of Ashura. We are products of Ashura. Ashura has trained our psyche and our being and has made us who we are. Everything that has happened, all the teachings of Ashura. And our future and our hope is Imam Mahdi and the government of Allah, right, that we're working for. So these two things, we find ourselves in a point in between these two things. That's why every important occasion that comes, Allah wants us to remember these two, our past and our future, to keep our goal in focus. Knowing where we come from, once we go back to our roots, then we will know uh, what you know uh, we are about, what our principles are. And if we know who we are living for and what we are living for, then that defines our goals and our responsibilities. So it is uh, Ashura that defines principles in us. What is my principle in life? Ashura. What do I think in life? Ashura. Everything goes back there. The teachings. In fact, Ashura is the culmination of all the teachings of the Prophet and the Imams. It was the most highlighted teachings of all time. That's why all the Imams emphasize that. Why did they emphasize Ashura for? Why did they emphasize Karbala for? The reason, my friends, is that the same things have been taught by Rasulullah, the same things have been taught by Imam Ali, the same things have been taught by Imam Hassan and Hazrat Fatima. You know, it's not different that they taught Imam Hussein taught differently. It was the same things. But the way and the way that Ashura happened, the way Karbala happened, the way Karbala has taught Islam is more highlighted, is more clear than any other time. Every other time you see there might be some confusion, some ambiguity in understanding what they meant by it. But in Ashura, there was no doubt. The teachings in Ashura became so clear, there's no doubt that this is so clear for us. It's so clear for us to happen. So this is why you see Ashura has been emphasized to us because we, our background is that. If we don't define ourselves that, you know what, you know, we are the children of Ashura, then we are Shias then. We haven't understood what Shia Islam is. We haven't understood that yet. Karbala should define us as a person. That yes, I'm defined by Karbala. That is my past. Right? You want to look at me? Look at Karbala. Learn it. Then you know that this is me. I am from that. Right? This is what defines us, my friends. And this is how we look at ourselves like that. So that's why you see in every occasion on Eid, whether it's Laylatul Qadr, whether it's any type of Eid, this and that, you see is always read Ziyarat of Imam Hussain on this night. Read Ziyarat of Imam Hussain. And read the Dua of Imam Mahdi. You know, your first Tajil. Every time, every Eid you see, it's happening. Because of this reason. This is who we are. I guess we have time for one more question, I guess. Uh, if the sisters have questions, you know, they can just write it down or something, you know. Ask, you know. But inshallah, we have this time after the speech. If you want to ask questions, it's in that. Uh, just one thing I want to say, right. For iftar, right. Instead of waiting till azan, have the iftar, you know the Sunnis because we are doing the iftar right before the Maghrib prayers. Do what the Sunnis do then, you know. Have the iftar ready in front of you so that when the azan is came, you can eat right away and come here. <laughs> right? And not that you line up after the azan and we take 15 minutes to come back. So I think, you know, inshallah, you know, if we take off right now, we'll close it here and we can go there and get ready for iftar. And as soon as the azan comes, you can start eating. And come back here sooner so we can pray the Maghrib prayer at its uh, fadila time. It's good to make it there because we're here and we should be making it in the opportune time for it. So inshallah, you know, let's do that from now on. We'll end about five minutes before so we can go there and get ready. Inshallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.